our first speaker uh, today is uh, Francis Daniel, Associate Professor uh, of Psychology from the Department of, of Psychology in the College of Arts and Sciences. And she's going to be talking to us on Memory and Language Research Lab. So, welcome. Thank you, Cynthia, and good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. So I'm going to actually be talking about work that I conduct with undergraduates in uh, the Language and Memory Lab in the Psychology Department. OK, so one of the constructs that I study is memory. And from a cognitive psychologist's perspective, memory is a multi-component system. So we have sensory memory, so like right now, your five senses are taking in information from your surrounding environment and dumping it into a very brief sense, uh, storage system. And we can easily grab information from that storage system and move it to another brief storage system, which you've probably heard of, known as short-term memory. Okay, yes. Now, short-term memory is something that we are consciously aware of. And we can only hold a couple of stuff, not a lot of stuff in there, so we have a limited capacity. Um, now, when we add that short-term store with attentional control, we call it working memory. So working memory is like what you have in your conscious awareness right now that you can manipulate or work with. Now, we can move information from sensory memory and working memory into a permanent storage system, which you've probably also heard of, called long-term memory. And we can also take information from long-term memory and activate it and place it into our working memory to become consciously aware of it. So what I'll be focusing on are errors that occur during this process. So I study errors in memory. And it turns out our memory is really bad, all of us. We all have really bad memory, unfortunately. It's fragile. Now, one of the reasons why our memory is awful is because it's reconstructive. So when you are trying to remember a past event, you have to actually reconstruct that event. And during that process, things can go wrong. So we often use shortcuts, or if they're suggestive influences, things can get altered. And it can be just a slight alteration to very drastic and anywhere in between. Another reason is because um, our long-term memory is basically a network of associations. So if I activate an association in my long-term memory, that activation is actually going to spread to strongly linked associations. And all of those can get placed into our conscious awareness. And my research that I'm going to talk about today really kind of focuses on this second reason. So this uh, leads me to my research on false memories. So to study false memories, I use a paradigm known as the dies rodiger mcdermott paradigm. And so in this paradigm, participants are shown a list of semantically related words. So that could be something like bed, night, pillow, and all of these words are centered around something called a critical lure. This is a word that is related to the list, but is itself not presented. And what we find, oh, then we ask participants to either recall or recognize the word list. And what we find is that they recall um, or recognize that critical lure at incredibly high rates. So the critical lure is recognized probably at around 80%, typically. This is known as the DRM task. And going back to the interconnected network, the reason why we recognize that critical lure is when we see the word list, we activate the critical lure word in long-term memory, gets placed into our conscious awareness, we believe we saw it. So we do know that if we warn participants ahead of time, we can actually reduce memory for that critical lure. Now, this warning has to be pretty explicit. So typically what we do is we give them an example word list we tell them what the critical lure word, that's email, tell them what the critical lure word is, and then we tell them, when you are performing the task and you see that word list, try and figure out what the critical lure word is, mark it in memory so that you can reject it when you are tested. And what we find is that actually can reduce memory for the critical lure pretty drastically from 80% to about 40%. 40%, you know, it's pretty 
pretty good. It's not great, but it's pretty good. So this leads me to my work um, that I conduct with students and I've been conducting with students for a while is we actually look at individual differences and the ability to use that, that warning to reduce memory for the critical alert. So I originally started this, when I originally started this work, we looked at working memory differences. And that is some people have good attentional control and others don't have great attentional control. And what we found is that people who had really good attentional control were better able to reject the critical alert during a test. And when they were unable to reject it, they failed to reject it, they were less confident in their memory versus those with poor attentional control, more likely to say they saw the critical alert and had pretty high confidence in those memories as well. Now, I've continued this work with undergraduates at Indiana University Northwest. And we always use a, um, a computerized version of the recognition task. Here's a little example right here. So basically, what would happen in that little box right there is participants would see 15 words one word at a time for about 1.5 seconds. And then after they would see all the words, they would be asked to click on this right here, click on all the words they remembered seeing, one of them being the critical alert. For roughly half of the participants, we would give them a warning, and then we would also measure some type of individual difference factor. So I want to quickly go over some of the more exciting individual difference factors that we have uh, studied over the, year, over the years. The first one is belief in paranormal activity. So let's, yeah, ghosts, spirits, things like that. And what we find is people who have low belief in paranormal activity are better able to use that warning to reduce memory for the critical alert. Heavy, media, multitasking. So let me define that really quick. So heavy, media, multitasking is a lot of our students who have tons of apps open at the same time, tons of screens, doing a whole bunch of stuff all at the same time and not well. Um, so we didn't let them heavy media multitask during this, um, during this test, but those who have are, do not engage in heavy media multitasking are better able to use the warning to reduce memory for the critical alert. I gotta go quicker. Cognitive reflection. So this is your, um, cognitive reflection is basically the ability to make careful thought out decisions versus more intuitive gut decisions. So people who are better able to make those well thought out decisions reduce memory for the critical alert substantially, close to 20%. So that was really effective. And the last one I want to talk about is actually work that we did this semester and I have students presenting this work at a conference next Friday. We looked at imagery. Yay, yeah. So when we tell participants to visualize the words when they see the word list, and we don't give them a warning, we actually see an increase in false memories. But if we tell them to visualize each word and give them a warning, we see a decrease in false memories. So that's um, pretty exciting. So take home. False memories are easy to create. And the ability to reduce them depends on a lot of factors. Thank you. <laughs>